Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that that is the only means. So very grateful, thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to just study your word together, to feast upon it. The opportunity to preach Christ and him crucified we give you all the the glory the honor and the praise i ask that you would filter out that which is of not of you but just seal to our hearts that which is true for it's in christ's name i pray amen we're studying together in the first epistle to the corinthians and in our last study together we'd reached the the uh, eighth verse, I believe, of the ninth chapter, chapter 9, verse 8. If you turn with me to the 15th chapter of Acts, uh, you know in our, in our study in 1 Corinthians, you know from previous videos how we've talked about that Paul uh, said, If eating meat makes my brother to offend, I'll eat no meat while the world stands. I'll eat no food. I do not want to sin against my brother who's equal with me in the sight of Christ. And if I cause my brother to sin against his conscience, I sin against Christ. Why? Because my brother's there because of Christ. He's my brother. Acts 15, the uh, 18th verse, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. We are his workmanship. Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Do you think that was true of Paul? So every single Christian was known to God before he ever created. And if I sin against my brother, that brother is, the, I'm sinning against a brother who's, he, He's Christ's workmanship. We are His workmanship, okay? Some Christians think that He, well, He did a good job of that. Many believe He did a bad job. I don't know, folks, why you go through what you go through. Everybody has different problems. Everybody has different issues, different trials and hardships. Some have really hard lives, some not so hard, but we are His workmanship. And did He make a mistake? Wrong health, wrong husband, wrong wife, wrong children, wrong job, wrong everything, okay? From our standpoint, some Christians look really, really great. And we have that problem in our present study. Uh, Paul, which, uh, which one of us, you know, let me just put it this way. I think it's a mistake to compare ourselves to Paul, even though he was our example. He was our example in many ways, but there's a way in which we don't compare ourselves to Paul. Okay, I don't think that any one of us could say that we somehow have been used uh, by God like Paul. Now that I may be wrong, that may be that may not be true, but Paul was specifically used by God in a very extraordinary way, and, and few of us are like Paul. I mean, who could go through what Paul went through? You know, I, I turn on the TV and uh, somebody's there yelling at me, telling me, boy, you know, boy, if you're really faithful and you put sin out of your life, you clean up the old man, the clean up the flesh, get your life on track, do what's right, you know, then everything is going to be great. And I look at Paul and nothing was ever great from, for him from a human standpoint beaten, stoned, left for dead. I mean, hi history uh, bears that out, those facts out. Uh, they, I believe he was rich. He was rich enough to s support himself on missionary journeys. So we could spend a lot of time uh, exalting Paul. You know, Paul, Paul was Christ's workmanship. Oh, but Steve, look at what all Paul did. You know, well, what did the thief on the cross do? He was a criminal, he was worthy of death, crucified for the crimes that he had committed. 
as far as I know, he never thought about God. And I read, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So I'm supposed to look at him as pathetic compared to Paul? They're both Christ's workmanship. Okay? So are you. So am I. So I have no right to sin against the conscience of another who's, who is Christ's workmanship. Christ made him the way that he is. If, if I think it's wrong, then I ought to take that up with God, not the individual. We love one another because we're all his children. We love one another because we're all different. And the very thing that we're seeing in 1 Corinthians, we don't want to sin against a brother. Is Paul not free? Absolutely. Can he not eat anything that he wants? Absolutely. Can he not drink anything he wants? Absolutely. The answers to all those questions has to be a resounding yes. Okay? Doesn't he have the power to lead about a wife? You know, whether that means uh, remarry or, or not, I don't know. Seems as though his wife left him. Uh, so if he's going to have a wife, he'd have to get another one. But I'm not sure of that. That's reading the white spaces. But surely he has that power. The text makes it clear that he has that power, that he has that right. Apparently Peter had that power. This really has nothing, not little to do with liberty, okay? It has everything to do with your brother in Christ. Somebody that God loves more than liberty, okay? And that you ought to love more than liberty, more than your Christian liberty. Somebody whom Christ loved and was his workmanship, we are his workmanship. The text says the guy that goes to war ought to get paid to do that. Okay? All right. You wouldn't expect him not to. And then there's the guy who plants a vineyard. Doesn't he profit from the, from the fruit? Absolutely. And there's a guy that has a flock. He raises animals. Should he not profit from that? Of course. Dearly beloved, the purpose of our present study is that God has established the principle that the one that plows has the right to profit from his work. And that's what the text says. Okay? For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Well, does God care for oxen? Well, I'm not I'm pretty sure he does. But he says it for our sakes, for our sakes. No doubt this is, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope and that he that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. The Holy Spirit says that being paid for preaching the gospel is perfectly normal. Right, let's make that clear right, right here. Let's just get that out of the way, okay? We can't argue with the text. If we've sown unto you spiritual things, it's why should we not reap carnal things, uh, material things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Okay. Even so, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. There's no question about that. The text doesn't argue against that. But I have used none of these things, says Paul. Neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my boasting, my glorying, void. Paul here has been led by the Holy Spirit to suggest that seeking payment for preaching the gospel of Christ could hinder that gospel. I want you to think about this, folks, okay? All right? I am astounded at the way people respond to requests for money from some of these TV so-called evangelists who act poor and, and are making millions. But I think this goes beyond that. 
Obviously, the text is that one of the great hindrances of the gospel of Christ is the, the appeal for money. No doubt about it. We, we know that. We see that. Okay. Do you not know that they who serve about holy things live of the things of the sanctuary of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are sharers or partakers with the altar. That's how the, the Levites lived. They lived by tax. The tithe was a tax. They had love offerings and worship offerings, but there was a tax, and the Levites lived by that. Okay? Dearly beloved, the Lord has ordained that those who proclaim the good news should live of that good news. All right? Now, there are those who suggest that, well, what that means is that, that if I preach that, that by accepting Christ that you're now redeemed and now you go to heaven instead of hell, that means that I also profit in that same thing. That's ridiculous. The, to the context, I've preached a lot about context. Folks, the context is that the one that proclaims the good news has the authority and has the right to be supported by the proclamation of that good news. That's what the text says. There is no scripture that can be used to say that the minister should not be paid. Okay? And I know this is, sounds like an advertisement for me. It's not. Listen, bear with me here. Okay? Everybody else is paid for what they do. Why should we expect a minister not to be paid for what he does? That's what the Holy Spirit is saying. That's clearly the purpose that God has ordained, that those who proclaim the good news should live as a result of that proclamation of good news. So why are we hearing Paul say what he's saying here? That's the question. So the eighth chapter ended with the Holy Spirit having Paul say dogmatically that if eating food made his brother to stumble, he had eat no flesh while the world stands. Because he doesn't want to sin against the weak brother's conscience. And then the ninth chapter begins a defense of liberty. So he has the liberty to do these things and more. However, I have to step back as I always have. I mean, are we looking at something that leads us to admire the Apostle, the Apostle Paul? Oh man, what a great, great guy this guy was. He, he's a hero, okay? What a great guy he was. Now, I'm not saying God didn't use Paul in a mighty way, folks. I'm not saying that. Why, but why did God have Paul write this? Paul didn't write it because he wanted to write it. Paul is not discussing with you his ideas, his his reasoning, his logic, in trying to defend his position, and he's in doing it in such a way that uh, we're left with a huge admiration for the Apostle Paul. It's not the purpose of this passage of Scripture. Okay, it, it's God's word to us. I, I imagine that Paul wasn't really very happy about writing all this. It's just contrary to his nature to write any passage of Scripture that would lead you to praise him, okay? If you know anything about the, the Apostle Paul. But keep in mind, God wrote this. Now, when he says, I've used none of these things, all right, verse 15, none of these things. What are these things he doesn't use? Those the Holy Spirit has him write. This is, this is not God praising Paul, folks. This is a message to us. I mean, surely he was used in a, in a great way. And we have several references, to, you know, more than one reference to that in the text. In the next few verses. The Lord ordained they that they which proclaim the gospel should live of the gospel. But I've used none of these things. This is, this is God's word, not Paul's. So I think God is saying that He doesn't expect to receive payment for proclaiming the gospel or for you being redeemed. There's nothing you can do to be redeemed. You, you don't owe God anything. That's what I think it's, it's saying. God's not asking us in, in any way to reward Him for someone preaching the gospel. All right? The Holy Spirit is saying through Paul that he did not have this apostle use any of those things. Why? After, after this long diatribe on how we deserve to be paid. I've written these things that they should be so done unto me for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my boasting void. 
to make it empty, to make it worthless. Paul is sitting there writing God's Word. You can call this Paul's Word if you care to, but it's, it is God's Word, not Paul's. He's the one who, that completed, Paul completed the Word of God. He was called to do that. God took someone whose all-consuming desire was to destroy the church of Christ. You know, in, in Galatians, the word destroy is, a, is an imperfect tense, which means he tried to destroy it, but he never did. He couldn't, okay? So surely the Holy Spirit wants us to realize that when Paul writes these things, there's been a dramatic change in his life. I will show him what things he must suffer for my sake, God says, said of Paul. So I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish in any way any uh, use of Paul by God. The Holy Spirit doesn't stand in our presence to preach, though. He speaks to us through His Word, and He had Paul complete the Word, and that's what Paul's doing right here. He's completing the Word of God. The proclamation of the good news, folks, is not a reason for personal gain. Kind of should go without saying. Nor does God expect to be compensated in some way for the good news. I am in no way departing from the fact that the Lord has ordained that they which proclaim the good news should live of the good news. I believe that, and I would never, ever, ever preach against a minister being paid, but much that goes on in the name of, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ is fundraising for personal profit. And that, I believe, is what the Holy Spirit is using Paul to argue against. But I think it's much more than that. I think we see much more than that in the text here. I've used none of these things. I have the liberty, but I've used none of these things. Why? Why didn't Paul use it? He, he had the right. Why didn't he do that? Why is God, who's writing through Paul, saying that he's used none of these things? And I haven't even written these things that it should be done unto me. This is what God is saying through the Holy Spirit. Better for me to die than any man should make my boasting void. And I cannot help but look at some of these TV evangelists and wonder if they believe that. I believe that that's the position that the Holy Spirit is taking through Paul. Verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. I believe that was before the foundation of the world, not on the road to Damascus. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. A compulsion has been placed upon me. It's a present passive. It's been laid upon him. He didn't lay it upon himself. And that's going to be important in the next verse. What Paul wanted to do was destroy the church or at least put to death those who professed to be Christians. That's what Paul wanted to do. But a compulsion had been laid upon him. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. When did that happen? Well, the, yeah, I guess, you know, depends on, on who you listen to. The broad view is that it was on the road to Damascus. I think that it happened before God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you know, uh, you can't say before he created the heavens and the earth, Paul was compelled. But you can say that compulsion was laid on him. There's an awful lot of stuff, folks, written about the Apostle Paul. And an awful lot of it's preached about Paul about what a change it was in his life and what an example he was and what a testimony he had. In fact, the Holy Spirit has him write that he's an example of all who, who should hereafter believe, be redeemed. Against his will, he was on a mission to destroy the church, to kill Christians. He did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's the way God works. You're not redeemed because you did anything, but because God did everything. A compulsion has been laid upon me so that woe is me if I do not proclaim the gospel. He's, got, he's going to proclaim it. Okay? It wasn't his idea, though. If God wants you, I believe if God wants you preaching the gospel, folks, He'll work it out. And no power in heaven or hell could ever stop that. And if He doesn't want you to, nothing, nothing can, can bring, nothing you can do. You can't do anything to bring yourself to do it. We are God's workmanship. Okay? That was true of Paul. It's true of you. And it's true of me. And it's been true of every ch child of God who ever lived. So if you are not preaching the gospel like Paul did, well, you can stop feeling guilty right now over verse 16. Is our God sovereign? Or is He not? Is He working in us both the will and do of His good pleasure? Or is He not? If He wants this YouTube ministry here, it's going to be here and nobody can stop that. If He doesn't want it here, it won't be so why would we want it here if he doesn't? So he's going to direct and overrule and his will is going to be done in heaven and on earth. So that compulsion is laid upon Paul. He didn't do it. It's God who separated Paul from his mother's womb. If Paul had died when he was six years old, he'd gone to heaven. If he had died when he was 13, he would have gone to heaven. If he had died when he was 21, he would have gone to heaven. His redemption was never in question, but his training period lasted, well, 50 years. Why was God training him? To teach him, to use him, to put him through experiences and training so that he would wind up to, to write God's Word the way God wanted it written. Okay? He was the in the hands of the sovereign God. Now we get to verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. If I do this thing willingly, and I do, says his, it's a first class condition, says the grammar, I have a reward. But on the other hand, if I do this thing against my will, and I do, it's another first-class condition. A dispensation or stewardship has been committed unto me. For all of Paul's brilliance, that didn't enable him to see Christ crucified in the law. He never saw it. His eyes were blinded. If a man that brilliant, that much of a student of the Old Testament Scriptures, I... Uh, I don't think it's possible for, you, for any of us to comprehend just how many years he spent studying it and memorizing it and how well he knew it and never saw Christ crucified. So, you know, so much for brilliance. It doesn't, doesn't really go all that far in Bible study. Brilliance doesn't do it. God does it. So when he suddenly realized, I mean, think of all that he knew in the Old Testament law, that's Christ. Wouldn't you want to go out and tell everybody in the world, particularly every Jew? Of course, the new man in Paul was thrilled to do this, but if against my will, well, that would be the flesh. You know, the flesh would say, now I'm not, I'm not saying this is what it, what it is, but this is what people have suggested, you know, you know, why is it against uh, the will of the flesh? Because the flesh would say, well, I want to make money out of this. Or I want to get gain power or influence over this. I, I want to have a good time. I want people to respect me. I, I don't want to be beaten with a lash three times, left for dead. I don't want to be stoned, left for dead. I don't, I don't want to be uh, cast into prison. I don't want people persecuting me and and hounding me and, and trying to put me to death and, 
and, and hating me. And finally, I don't want to be beheaded in Rome. So I'm preaching the gospel against my will. The, the problem with that is that maybe the new man would like to proclaim the gospel, but it's inconceivable that the old man would actually want to proclaim the gospel. He may want to use that proclamation to raise money, but he wouldn't do a very good job of it. So it's just very difficult to see two natures there. If I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. Yet the second statement seems to say he isn't doing it willingly. And yet the very next verse says, what is this reward that I have? I, I think that that verse is saying that in one sense I do this willingly, but in another a compulsion, a necessity was, has, has been placed upon me so that it isn't my will that does it. Yes, I do proclaim the gospel willingly. I do because compulsion has been laid upon me and therefore I do deserve a reward. So I have to deal with that reward in the next verse. On the other hand, it's not me that decided to do it. The Holy Spirit is telling us that the Apostle Paul, not the minister here or some major evangelist, but the Apostle Paul himself was forced by the sovereign God to proclaim the gospel and that without charge. Okay? And what the text is saying is that his proclamation of the gospel is nothing of his own will and his own desire and his own design. It's all from God. So what kind of a reward is there then? What is my reward? Well, let me tell you, truly, that reward is that when I preach the gospel, I may offer that, God, that good news of Jesus Christ without any charge, without charge, okay? That I abuse not my right or authority in that good news. I believe that's the words of the Holy Spirit, not Paul. I've emphasized this at the, at, in, a, in, many, in many a video. God has offered us good news. In this particular case, through Paul, without charge. You know, the firstborn son was condemned and, and, and the only solution to that condemnation was his father putting blood over the doorpost, offering a sacrifice and applying the blood. The son did nothing. The father did it all. It doesn't matter whether the kid believed or, or, or didn't believe, whether he stayed up all night chewing his fingernails down to the quick. It didn't matter, worrying himself to death, whether he rested, whether he didn't rest. The son had nothing to do with it, okay? His, his father and only his father was responsible for his escaping death, and that is true of us. That's true here. God and God alone is responsible for us receiving that good news, and he has Paul proclaiming that good news, and Paul doesn't want to be cheated out of the fact that God has used him to proclaim that good news without charge so that he did not abuse any right he says, a stewardship of the gospel was committed unto me. Verse 17. That was done. A perfect passive. Done. That stewardship of the gospel was committed many, many years ago, I believe, before the foundation of the world. And what we are asked to see in verse 17 is the present enduring reality of that committal. I do not believe that any other person was used by the Holy Spirit as was Paul. Now, you know, we can have arguments about that all day long. But he was used to complete the Word of God. Moses was used to write a, a portion of the, of, the, of the Word of God. But Paul, to complete the Word of God, I'm going to say pretty close to all that we call doctrine comes from what the Holy Spirit had Paul write. I have made myself a servant unto all that I may gain the many. 
in, in context, that word all could mean everybody, but dearly beloved, whether you like it or not, it also could be the, mean those who are God's people. He came into this world to save His people from their sins. The Holy Spirit through Paul in a different place said that He endures all things for the elect's sake, that He may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He's not enduring all things for everybody, but for the elect's sake. In fact, that's our context here. That's our context. That by all means I made all things to all men, that by all means I might save some, not redeem some, save some. That's verse 22. Five times we have the word gain. One time we have the word save. I've made myself a slave to all, and I'm going to suggest those are all Christians. Elect people. That, now, that's a good word, gain. And I can't say gain means saved. These are two different words. I think gain means gain, and saved means saved. We gain them into the group where they understand that through the Lord Jesus Christ, They've been rescued. They've been, they've been saved. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew. Paul was clearly already a Jew. What he's saying is that when he was in fellowship with Christian Jews, you know, the Jews didn't much, had much, they didn't think much of Paul at first. I've made myself a servant unto all. I believe those to be God's elect. And that applies in verse 21 and verse 22. So we're only looking at God's elect. That's what I'm going to suggest here. Paul is not enduring all things for the non-elect. I've become as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under, under law, I, I, I want to gain the Jews. And I want to gain those that are under the law in fellowshipping with Jews. I'll act like I'm a Jew. Not doctrinally as a Jew, but live like a Jew. I'm not doing it for the non-elect for the ones who are not God's children. I'm doing it for God's children. To them that are without law, now that could, to me, folks, that could only be the Gentiles. You cannot build a case for total abstinence from alcohol from the Scriptures or say to, to, the, uh, to the brother, as long as you're drinking alcohol, you're going to hell. I mean, yeah, it's easy to love a brother and not violate his conscience. It really is. That's 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 not doctor because it's not doctrinal discussion. Or 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 it shouldn't be, but sometimes it is. Peter and Paul withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Why? Because he was doctrinally in error. I don't go along with somebody who speaks doctr doctrinal error. Okay, and I don't mind pointing that out. I don't think that's what the text is saying. What it says here is, is this. Why should I do anything that destroys my brother for whom Christ died? Why should I do that? Folks, we've been offered... Uh, let, let, me, let me say that. Okay, if I was in back in Bible college, let's say I'm back in Bible college and we're in the classroom and there's the instructor up front and he, he, he poses this question to the class. And he says... He said, all right, everybody get a piece of paper and a pencil, and I want you to write down why you think, why do you think Paul is saying, I don't, I don't expect to be paid. I don't want to exercise that right to be paid. I, I'm not, I'm not, I want to preach the gospel without charge. That's what I want to do, despite the fact that God absolutely ordained that those who preach the gospel should make a living from the gospel. But me, now, I'm the exception. I don't want to do that. And I'm, I've made a decision not to do that. This was Paul's decision to do that. Paul said he was going to. This was what Paul said that he was going to do. He made up his mind he was going to be different. Listen to me, folks. Listen, I, 
I know I don't explain things sometimes very well, but I'm going to suggest that God ordained that this person, Paul, who brought the gospel of salvation, that completed the word of God and brought that salvation to the Gentiles, that good news to the Gentiles, I'm going to suggest that God devised, decreed, designed, ordained, constructed, whatever word, adjective you want to use, He designed Paul's life in such a way as to represent a gospel which was free, that you didn't owe anything to God. Okay? No payment to God. God doesn't want your payment. He doesn't want any payment. He doesn't want any, any compensation from you. for that gospel. Don't you think that there's something a little odd going on in here in the text when the Holy Spirit goes to such great lengths to make it absolutely crystal clear without question that a minister of the gospel should be supported by the gospel. And yet, Paul, Paul, now I, listen, I can understand the argument. Okay, I can hear it right now. I, you know, well, Paul was our example. So now, even though all, all that that God said is true, that a, uh, that you know a workman's worthy of his wages, and even even when it comes to the gospel, the same is true. Even though God said all that, Paul's our example. He's not wanting to charge for preaching the gospel. So therefore. He's, he's set an example that all the rest of us should follow. Now, you can take that position if you want to. I can't do that. I see under, underlying there in, in the message, I, under the surface there, I, I don't believe I'm reading white spaces. I believe that when you take factor in everything that, that God has asked us to consider here, I think God is showing us that there is no compensation that you could make to God for your redemption. Look, until next, we'll talk about this some more. Until next time, thank you all for continuing to follow us. Pray for the direction of this ministry. Pray for me. I am asking for your prayers concerning a recent slight injury that's nothing big to worry about, just uh, it's causing some pain. Uh, until next time, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. And thanks for watching.